First of all, thank you for allowing me to be here today. Um, Utah is my favorite state because I have the most uh, Twitter followers in Utah. Um, in particular, I will recognize Jua for being the most retweeters of things that I post. Um, I like Utah so much, I decided in December to move to Las Vegas to be uh, neighbors with you guys. <laughs> so I invite all of you to Las Vegas anytime you want. Uh, I live right on the strip. <laughs> I, I, I know. So, so we're going to do a little test. Um, the first test is this side I'm just going to take a selfie with. Bing. And this side, let's see if we could do a, a fun looking selfie. Oh, pretty good. All right, a lot of, a lot of miming, huh? <laughs> so what I wanted to do was talk to you a little bit about uh, four things. Uh, one is just to frame this conversation. I've been trying to, you know, millennials, everyone talks about millennials, but uh, you know, there, there is something happening with the workforce and I wanted to share some findings that I, I've come up with. Um, and and then from there, like, you know, I've noticed in working with hundreds of schools over the last 10 years, uh, I've also noticed patterns that prevent us from getting stuff done. And what I wanted to share was some of those findings. And then finally, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the things that we need to do are about habits and behaviors and how we interact with each other. And so although people always think of me as, you know, the Asian technology guy that's six foot three, um, I'm actually really thinking about a lot of personal relationships and not only how do the adults interact with each other, but how do the adults interact with the students. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk to you about is the needs of our workforce. And um, just to kind of go through the history of kind of the workforce in the 50s and 60s, it was kind of like uh, Mad Men, right? You know, we had typewriters and people were working, kind of punching the card, uh, nine to five shifts. We had cubicles. Uh, this might look like some of the central offices right now, um, except for the smoking and alcohol. So, uh, you know, I mean, this is kind of the workforce that a lot of us grew up in, or a lot of us kind of understood. And, and in many places across the country, it's still that way. Uh, going to, to several districts across the country, you know, often there are these big doors, there's a secretary behind the glass, uh, you got to get buzzed in, and then you go to the next office, and the secretary for the superintendent, you wait for 15 minutes, you're already 20 minutes late, you know, all of this, there's an experience that is kind of like this, this world. Um, Kind of in the 2000s to 2010, now apparently we're working less. Uh, we've gone down to 37.5, except for educators. I think educators work like you know more than that. Um, and then the the notion of like remote work and co-office uh, co-sharing uh, started to come up. So now that technology was uh, more prevalent and we had internet access, we could work from home. Uh, there's more startup companies popping up, and so we started sharing offices. And then if you notice the attire, we went from like Brooks Brothers to Gap. So, so you know, this, in the future, kind of what people have been thinking about is, well, we'll end up working even less. And quite frankly, the, the folks that I hire that are millennials, they, they want to work really, I mean, they don't want to work like nine to five jobs either. You know, they want to work less. They want to have work-life balance. I hear about these things. Um, and our attire will, will change completely. It'll almost become like uniforms, because we'll all be wearing Facebook uniforms or you know, Google uniforms. We already kind of do when we wear t-shirts. Um, and then the, the most important thing is, I think, work and life will be more integrated. And there will be a complete blurring. And we already experienced this, because we have phones that we're you know, at, the, at our kids' games and we're responding to emails. You, um, we pick up the phone at middle of the night or, you know, when we wake up, the first thing we do is check our email. I mean, I do that. So it's already happening. But while we don't want it to happen, the next generation actually expects it to happen. Like, that's the way they want to live. 
So just to give you a, a few examples, um, one is just about um, the gig economy or what we call the on-demand workforce. And these are folks that are Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, right? They could work their own hours. They're entrepreneurs in their own way. Um, they get to uh, offer services online. They don't have to have an office. They don't really have to have a boss. They could make products and sell them online. Uh, they could, you could rent a room in your house and see if people want, want to come and uh, rent it out from you, especially when there's a game or there's a concert or there's Sundance Film Festival. You know, when something's happening, it's easy to do that and make extra money. And this, is, this has changed the dynamic of how people think about the future of work. They don't want to be told what to do all the time. The next generation is really gone to this area, which is the digital nomad. And when I was researching this, it was really surprising uh, what they're looking for. And if you look at the top picture, this is an actual comp, or uh, it's, a, it's a business that allows you to like kind of stay at a resort while you work. I mean, I, I wanted to go there actually. Um, so, so if you think about like why they're interested in this, it's like, well, you know, the freedom to be who you are. They don't even know who they are, but they want the freedom to find that out. And it, I mean, I, I still don't know who I am, but I, I, I would love, to, I would find, find out if I was there. Um, the other thing is, uh, because we have access to the internet and we could travel and it's, you know, you jump on a Southwest flight, whatever, you can pretty much work from anywhere. You know, we have video conferencing now. It's very easy for us to have kind of a remote work experience and a remote relationship. And by virtue of using Facebook and Instagram, it's just more, we're more used to it than we have ever been before. Um, and then uh, kind of crafting your own lifestyle has always been something that people wanted. You know, what, some people might want to work out and do yoga and then start work at 10 and then, you know, do some stuff and go fishing and then come back and do work. That's kind of the life, they want to like fully integrate their work and life like I talked about before. And so this is happening today. And, uh, surprisingly, I went to do a little bit more research and I actually found sites. Uh, this is called Nomad List. And there are sites that will tell you uh, how many nomads there are, how much it costs to live there a month, what the weather is like. And if I click on one of these things, I was fascinated by some of the things that they represented, like uh, super fast bandwidth, nice weather. Um, quality of life, uh, safety, air quality. These are all things that these digital nomads are looking for. So now that like, you're, you want this kind of experience, uh, there's some digital nomads right here. Uh, I was thinking, OK, well, what's going on in education? Well, this is what's going on. We're working more than 24 hours a day. right? It's crazy, especially if there's a snow day, then it's like 26 hours. And then um, there are 5 million educators across the country, and we have a shortage of educators in, across the country. Right? We can't get enough people. And part of the reason is it's a, it's a, the work conditions are very different than the ones that I just described to you. And then finally, uh, and this is more of a, a national number across multiple industries, we sit in over 27 million meetings a day across the country. Uh, superintendents probably sit in 15 million of those, right? Uh, school board members and such. So, so what the next part of this conversation I wanted to have with you is really around meetings. And I, I really do think that meetings and how we work in teams really prevents the way, pre prevents us from achieving all the goals that we want to achieve in education and in our strategic plans and in our, uh, in our work. So the, part of the reason I took the, the selfie pictures with you guys is this is a, a picture we took recently in Denver at a, a leadership institute we conducted. And if you look at this one, this was kind of the first picture that was the left side of the room. And then we said, hey, take a funny picture and it looks exactly the same. 
I mean, literally, it looks exactly like this dude. Like, look, the guy on the left kneeling down, exactly the same. Uh, the laser is not working, but there's a guy who's like actually started leaning back a little bit. He's leaning forward and leaning back. Uh, so, so I thought it was funny because it's like, hey, let's do a crazy picture, and it was like not crazy at all. And and so, they're not. What I noticed is at the at the actual workshop, we were dancing, we were playing games. We I mean we did some serious stuff, but there was a lot of stuff. But then it wasn't second nature. They had to be prompted more than just do it uh, in order for them to kind of loosen up. And one of the things that I noticed is a, a lot of the times we kind of take our work really seriously. And sometimes like we kind of have to have fun in the work in order for you to come back. Because especially if you're trying to recruit some of the new folks that we just talked about, tr creating a fun and joyous and uh, integrated, inclusive environment is really critical for them to feel valued. And so uh, building that habit is really hard. I'm going to show you a short video on maybe a meeting that you've been in or a typical meeting that we see across the country that might help kind of bring some of this to light. Allow me to play devil's advocate here, but allow me to be a for a second, but with no consequences. Let's pull back on that for a second. I fell asleep while you were talking and I have no idea what's happening. Huh? I've got a stupid question. It's actually like a really smart question, but I was wondering if I say stupid beforehand, does that make me like kind of modest? Is that like sort of charming thing to do, right? Let's pick that up in the next meeting. I need a few days to figure out what the hell you're talking about. But will this scale? One of the managing directors once used that phrase in a meeting, so now I use it all the time. Sorry, this is just a work email I have to answer. I'm actually playing words with friends with everyone else in this meeting but you. Um, do you know a four-letter word for long-winded? There's an outside chance you might be right. You're wrong. <laughs> you're definitely wrong. I think what you're trying to say is, so what I'm gonna do is take that idea and then make it sound like it was mine. Let's try to make this viral, okay? I just heard about this site called reddit.com. Can we get on there? I think we should make this a cross-platform opportunity. I watch Shark Tank. Let's take this offline. Yeah, can we pick this up again, um, just maybe 15 minutes after uh, never again? Well, that's one idea. It's actually the one idea that sucks the most, so thank you. This might be off topic. This is off topic, and it's gonna be a while. All right, great meeting. So just please send me all your ideas before EOD. Uh, this meeting could have just been an email, but I'm very lonely. So, uh, I, I mean, how, hands, like how many of you actually experienced any component of a meeting like that? Come on, you guys aren't raising your, yeah, all right, all right. Feel, you make me feel a little bit better. Um, so I got, I got another activity for you. Uh, this one is called the CIA mission. Uh, I used to be a secret agent and um, found this mission. Uh, and the, basically, you know, we're going to take a minute just with your neighbors. What are five ways you could sabotage an organization from the inside out without violence? All right, start talking. All right, I think there's, uh, you guys have a lot of ideas about this. Um, so what I wanted to share with you is the, the actual handbook from the CIA. This is like legit. I found it on the internet. Um, so if, if you do Google CIA handbook, this does come out and it says declassified. Um, and this is on page uh, 28 and 29. I, I am older than I look. I'm 48, so I've got to do this now. Um, so, so let's, let's kind of dig into this a little bit, right? So the first one is let's make speeches. Talk as frequently as possible at great length. Illustrate your points with long anecdotes and account for personal experiences. Uh, next one. Whenever possible, refer to all matters to committee for further study. <laughs> that never happens. And then... Um, Bring up irrelevant issues all the time. 
How long are your board meetings? <laughs> Number five is like my favorite because we've been doing this for eons, right? Uh, haggle over precise wording communications and minutes. You know, is it a standard? Is it a competency? Is it a proficiency? Is it what? What is it? Is it an assessment? What? And so we haggle over these things over and over again that prevent us from getting work done. Because the talking part is not getting the work done. Right? Getting it in front of the kids is getting the work done. And then, of course, you know, refer to matters that have already been decided. So kind of moving on from that, now that like, we all kind of feel the pain, um, one of the things that I've started doing was uh, talking to a lot of other districts across the country and talking to human resources folks around what's going on in terms of the way they structure and organize their districts. And I do think that there will be a need for us to rethink the org structure of a district because it's been structured in such a way that it's more kind of the industrial rev rev uh, revolution structure with the top-down pyramid versus more of a network structure, which is the way a lot of organizations are set up. So I wanted to chat with you a little bit about that today. Um, the first is we have to move from committees to teams. Organizations are not successful in committees. Because committees, people, everybody sits in the committee and everybody is part of the decision. And everyone, you try to get everyone to say something as part of that and then you try to integrate it into a decision which ends up being a terrible decision because you're trying to take everybody's pieces and make it one. Um, next is meeting time should be practice time. When, you know, oftentimes when we get together, it's high stakes, right? Like, you know, you have uh, 10, 15 people that are the most highly paid individuals within your organization getting together for hours at a time, yet we spend no time practicing how to work together. And all of our time is spent kind of planning what might, might happen without really understanding how other people work around the table. And then finally, we have to move away from programs to projects. And what I mean by that is uh, every district that I've worked with, there's at least 50 programs that they have going. And they're not sure how, when they started and how long they're going to go on for. They're just ex in existence. And there's committees that meet on these programs weekly. And the projects really change that behavior to a definitive start and end time. So I'll, I'm going to just kind of walk you through each one of those a little bit. One is like a sports team, right? We, I, I love watching basketball, Golden State Warriors fan. And what, one of the things I always hear the coach talking about is we have to practice more, right? After the game, he observes what's going on. And they're like, we got to practice more. And they spend days practicing. Coach puts out a couple plays, you know, draws them out uh, with the captains, but they practice those plays over and over again so that you could throw a no-look pass. I, I ask you guys to think about your teams and see who you could throw a no-look pass to because that's very hard to do, you know, where some, a teammate on your, in your organizations can actually anticipate and predict what you might do and know exactly what to do once you pass them the ball. So <clears throat> through this exploration, um, we came up with my uh, co-author and I, my co-author Alexis Gonzalez-Black. She was uh, part of the uh, Nevada School Board. And she worked at a company called Zappos. My wife spends 10% of my salary there. <laughs> and, um, uh, and then she went to an organization called IDEO, which is a design firm that you know, designed the mouse and other, other cool things. Um, and some of the projects that she was involved with was like taking the Toronto airport and helping them reorganize their the airport uh, org structure so that they could be more customer friendly. And so we partnered up because she really had a lot of experiences around organ other organizations doing this kind of work. 
and then I translated that to uh, educationese, and then created case studies. So the first chapter really talks about uh, planning, and, and planning is planning for change, not perfection. And it's like, for example, a, a school improvement grant. We all do school improvement grants. We have to plan them out for three years. We never execute on any of those plans. Um, and that's because things change, like people change, the technology change, the priorities change, the needs change. So things are changing constantly. So we spend so many hours, days, weeks, putting the plan together, but we never execute on it because we never get to the execution part. Second, uh, teaming, building trust and allowing authority to spread. Uh, we all talk about like distributed leadership. What we really mean is like uh, if I give you something to do, I want you to do it the way I, I envisioned it in my head. But we never really spend the time explaining what that is. And so actually giving authority and building trust is really about that practice. Like how do I have practice with you so that I could trust that you'll catch the ball when I'm ready to pass it? And then uh, managing roles, defining the work before we define the people. You know, a, a simple example of this is if I go to a district and I said, who's responsible for principal development? Everybody raises their hand. And then I say, who gets fired if principals don't get developed and no one raises their hand? Because everybody feels like they own part of it, but no one really owns it because no one was told that you're, you're the one person accountable for this. Oftentimes, when a, a program or initiative gets started, we say, OK, what are, who are the titles that we need around the table? And it turns out like we always have the same people. right? If you think about the meetings that we're regularly in, we have the same 75% of the people are the same people that are in every other program. And so we, we're not going to get build capacity within an organization. We certainly don't have enough people in education to be part of all of those programs. Um, decision making, aim for safe enough to try. This is uh, pretty hard versus consensus, consensus building because consensus building is safe. Like what happens with consensus building is I go around to everybody and I say, hey, um, I have $500 in my pocket. Let's go around to everybody here and decide how best to use the $500. And so we would sit here till tomorrow uh, arguing about how to best use it. And then finally, we would rush into some sort of plan. And the reality is like, we have to get moved towards a safe enough to try attitude. Like, Not everybody needs to be part of that decision. People can be informed, but if you have clear roles, Right? You could make decisions, try something, get some data, and move forward. Uh, sharing information, let information flow. Just a quick example. I was uh, working with a district in New York, and uh, it was about 30 administrators. And it turns out the chief of HR quit that morning. Uh, the meeting was about uh, hiring new principals and teachers. So half the room knew that the chief HR person left, and the other half didn't. So the half that didn't was following a completely different plan than the other group. And so I went to the superintendent. I was like, hey, can we just tell everybody like, so that we don't waste two hours talking about it? And, and we did. And so now like, we were able to work it out. But when we don't have the information we need to work, it, we make bad decisions. And then finally, uh, learning organizations. How do we create a learning organization? We're in schools, but we aren't designed to be a learning organization. And when the schools grow, and when the adults grow is when the students grow. So what are some of the habits, and how do we make change? Because now that you know, I gave you the perfect formula for making, making change, like what are the steps that I could take? And, and so, so first of all, change is hard, right? Like if, if uh, it was easy, like every New Year's resolution that I promised myself, I would have done by now, or started. Um, so, the, so change happens in, at multiple levels. One's at the atomic level. And the atomic level are, happens to be things that I could do myself. Right? So if I said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop eating carbs at the beginning of the year, I could pretty much make that decision. I don't need everybody else involved. Uh, the ne next level is molecular. And molecular level is when me and a table, a group of folks, need to make a decision or agree on something, right? So uh, one might be, I don't want carbs in my house. 
And so several people need to agree, or I'm going to start every meeting with a protocol. And that could change. Everyone kind of needs to understand the protocol. And then finally, cellular level change happens when I have to take this table, and they have to go off and transfer ideas and convince other tables to do some of the things that they're, they're working on. And that's when you start connecting and making organizational change. So often, we try to cha make change at the cellular level without changing the individual behaviors. So I'm going to talk a little bit about individual behaviors. One is um, uh, just a simple rule. A lot of people have talked about this. There's a lot of controversy. I'm going to admit it. But I'm going to talk about it. And it's the 1% rule. So basically, what the 1% rule says is if you improve 1% every day at the end of a year, you'll be 37 times better, or 3,700% uh, 3, improvement. If you do not do something every day by 1%, then you're going to be zero by the end of the year. And things like that, the habits are true like that, right? So for example, um, my mom lives in the same city, and I, I don't text her every day. But if I did, like I would, you know, I would build a habit. And so I would get that much better, and think, uh, my communication and relationships would get better. Just like some friends, like if I don't talk, I, like the, I, I don't communicate with them on a regular basis over time, it kind of, the relationship kind of disappears. And so we've all experienced things like that. The other, other finding that we had was it takes about 70 days of you doing something for you to see noticeable change. Because that's when you see twice the improvement. It takes 70 days to get there. And so that's kind of true of things like, you know, you could start going to the gym and working out every day. You do a, a little bit of exercise, and you're not going to see immediate benefits week one. You'll see a little bit, but you'll see dramatic benefits in two months. So uh, we've tested this out, and I, I encourage everybody that runs an organization to do experiments on your people. Um, and, and these are the types of experiments that we try with our folks. So the first one was uh, a meditation experiment. I read a bunch of research on meditation. Five minutes of meditation can change how you feel about the whole day, right? And uh, what I realized is five minutes I, doesn't seem like a lot. Five minutes, you could spare five minutes. But it's really hard to get an organization to do that. Uh, so we had a, uh, a challenge for 30 days, meditate every day for 30 days. Minimum requirement is five minutes. Uh, the way it worked out was 15 people signed up. Uh, after one week, uh, there was like seven or eight people. And then after two weeks, there were like five. And the people that did it every day, including myself, uh, this was last year, November, uh, including myself, once I completed the challenge, I still meditate today. And so what that taught me is like the habit you have to do it a certain number of days consistently in order to get it right. Um, I also did other things like uh, random acts of kindness. So this was during Christmas time. We said, hey, do random acts of kindness. So like people would buy, turn, like, literally turn around in Starbucks line, buy something for the person behind them, and that was it. Um, or we would you know, write nice notes in hotel rooms for the housekeepers uh, just to do something nice that they wouldn't expect. And again. One of, the, one of the things that I noticed with that and a picture a day, one of the things I noticed is just having one or two people do it each day and sharing it wasn't enough. You need momentum. You need kind of like five or six people doing it. And then once five or six people are doing it, it, gets, it became like 10 people doing it because they saw momentum too. And so that was something that we learned. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about four different categories of habits and how you can make those changes. One is uh, instantaneous change. And this is like, I just decide to do it and go do it, right? Like the, I'm not going to eat carbs. I just, just start doing it. And it, that, that's typically very hard, because there's a lot of uh, device, devices that come up, or a lot of convincing that happens and mentally uh, that prevent you from doing it. Like, I'll just have one, whatever. And then, and then changing environments. So this is something like. Uh, you know, there's studies that say, like, picking up your phone the minute you wake up is probably one of the worst things you could do to start off your day. But we, I do it. My phone's, like, right there, right next to me, right? 
And so recommendations I've read are around like putting your phone in a completely another room, right? And changing the environment. That is frightening to me. I mean, who would have thought like putting your phone in another room would have been that frightening, but it is. And then the other is uh, a practice behavior, so it's just forcing yourself to do it. And uh, one of my colleagues, he's just, he com committed to doing push-ups every day, you know, just 20. And I was like, why'd you pick 20? He's like, well, just getting into the push-up position is the hard part. Like whether you do 1, 20, or 100, doesn't matter after that, after that point. Getting into the position is the hard part. And then uh, overriding existing habits. My, my accountant, uh, he used to be a smoker. And uh, all of a sudden, I started seeing packs of Tic Tacs on his desk. And so he, every time he wanted a cigarette, he ate a Tic Tac. And so he would never share those darn Tic Tacs with anybody. So um, I know we're kind of tight on time here. So what I wanted to do, and I'll, I'll share this out with everybody if you want it. But I'm just going to explain to you one, one way I started making change in our organization and other organizations. One's called the uh, One Thing Tool. And it's just a, bl a blank piece of paper. You fold it into four pieces. And it's a reflection tool for leaders. Um, so the questions that come up are, like, what, are we, what are, am I doing as a leader that prevents my team from achieving? And just, just write down one thing. Uh, what do we need to get better at as a team? Just write down one thing. Uh, everyone on the team can start doing something tomorrow. Like, what's one thing our team could start implementing tomorrow that everyone could start doing right away? And then finally, uh, what do we need to do more of to engage our teams? Because engagement is a critical thing for retention, right? And so, you know, here's an example of what I wrote. Uh, assuming my team knows exactly what I'm thinking. Like, this happens all the time. I'm sure it happens with you guys. Like, you give, uh, you want to move forward with something, you just assume everybody knows. Uh, another for, the next one would be capturing diverse ideas before I act. Like, making sure I get a diverse set of ideas. But sometimes I create teams with people that have similar ideas. And so I, I really want to focus on creating diverse ideas. Um, practicing group norms. So we have protocols that we implement so that we have a common norm so that when uh, I'm passing the ball, they know when to receive it. You know, we're playing basketball versus football. Like, it's just we know the rules. And then finally, I try to make every one-hour meeting with five minutes of fun and five minutes of closing with something positive, a positive reflection. So going back to teams and digging in a little deeper, you might, go, you might say, well, where, where has this been proven? And Hollywood has proven some of this stuff uh, year over year. Hollywood produces $100 million movies, and they produce several of them right, every year. And uh, different teams are parts of those, uh, the production of those movies. You know, there's a screenwriter, a casting director, there's an executive producer, and then you, a location manager. And as you go through the process, not everybody is part of the movie creation. People come and go. And that's an important thing for you guys to think about as you launch your projects. So some of the systems that we need to put in place. So this is an actual example of a system that a movie company has put together to show you all of the stages a movie goes through. And this could be could, the same for any kind of initiative or project that you guys have in a district. So imagine if you had something like this and you could say, well, what stage is uh, the early literacy project at? Well, it's at stage five. And at stage five, like these are the people that, are, that need to be involved. Like that would be an easy way for us to understand how pro where projects are at any stage. So an example of this is we have one internally that we use. It's, I'll walk you through it. It's I have an idea. <laughs> We validate it's a good idea. We bring some people together and work on it. Um, we kick the project off, right? We share kind of the goals of the work. Uh, we debrief on the project actions. We collaborate. We understand that people have these different actions and we know who's doing what. Uh, we get, achieve some of the goals. We test on it. And then we continue to do it again. 
And so through each stage of the project, we move it forward by understanding these steps. And the reason this is so important is because uh, this comes from uh, Deloitte Consulting. And on the top left, you'll see the typical org chart, right? This is the way we think things happen. The superintendent at top, there's somebody on the side, and then building principles or another layer of management below, and we think that information kind of flows down, which it doesn't. Uh, when we ask leaders how they think they manage, they think it's like the top right, which is, well, you know, like I'm a leader at different things, and um, I manage several teams, uh, but it's still kind of like top down. And the reality is, depending on what role you have, you, you have a different position of leadership. In some cases, you're the superintendent and you have a leadership position. In some cases, you're at part of the Chamber of Commerce and you have a different position. In the board meetings, you have a different role. And so being really clear on the roles you have would be essential. So when it comes to learning, how does learning transfer within your organization? How do you take some of this and bring it in? Um, the first idea is you have to have an expert. Like experts are good at transferring knowledge quickly. Then you need a peer network. Peer networks are how you build momentum. And then the transfer is when you teach somebody else how to do something is how you learn. And so if you want to increase the slope of learning, then you have experts. You, they could help you accelerate how fast you go. The plateaus we have in learning, your peer network creates that momentum to make plateaus as short as possible. And then transferring that knowledge makes it deeper. And this is true for students as well. We've studied John Hattie's effect size work. And when we see some of the behaviors and the habits that you need to put in place, things like transferring actually produce the most learning. So, Kind of to wrap this up, what I wanted to test with you is this uh, framework for, for learning. And the first is, in order for some of the things to ha uh, occur, the things, the, the habits to occur, first you have to practice. As you practice, it becomes a habit. And as, you, as it becomes a habit, it becomes part of your condition or your environment or your identity. The other way things happen is through a strategy. You have a strategy, and as you practice that strategy, you actually learn it. And so if you go kind of across, the strategies become a belief. So I have a hypothesis of something that might work. Once it starts working, I start believing in it. And once you start believing in something, then you build a community. You have relationships with other people that have similar beliefs. And then on the bottom, as you learn something, you innovate. And as you innovate, you evolve. And so it's a, a multi-directional way of learning and thinking this through. Um, I appreciate every, everything you guys do. And I appreciate you guys inviting me to speak with you today. And finally, uh, please follow me on Twitter. I'm trying to get to 4,000. 4, uh, <laughs> write a book review on Amazon. And if you uh, direct message me, I will be certain to share with you this presentation. Thank you.